Hey everyone, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. Today we're sharing a conversation that we had a lot of fun with, along with an exciting announcement about the work we're doing at Faith Matters. Our guest was our friend Jared Halverson. Few people we know exude as much enthusiasm for scripture, the Latter-day Saint canon in particular, as Jared does. He's someone who clearly loves and cherishes these holy texts, and has taken the best they have to offer to heart. He's as genuine, loving, and big-hearted as they come. So we felt Jared would be the perfect person to talk to to kick off this year's study of the Book of Mormon, the book Joseph Smith called the keystone of our religion. In our discussion with Jared, we talked about how we might be able to gain something from engaging with the book, regardless of where our faith is at, how scriptures are the means, not the end, and how they're not frozen in time. They're part of an ongoing conversation that we're a part of. And with all that said, we could not be more excited to tell you that Faith Matters is formally teaming up with Jared to bring his podcast, Unshaken, one of the most widely engaged scripture study podcasts out there, into the Faith Matters network of podcasts and YouTube shows. We'll have more to share about that in the future as the network expands and grows. For now, it means that Jared will continue to bring his signature blend of scholarly rigor and devotional reflection to his discussions of scripture that move with the Come Follow Me curriculum. But whereas in the past, Jared's podcast episodes have been deep dives of three to five hours per episode, the new Unshaken format will shoot for an hour or so to make them a bit more digestible. Unshaken will continue to operate on its own YouTube and podcast channels, while the Faith Matters podcast will continue to operate on this one. If you're interested in Jared and his work based on what you hear today, we'd highly recommend you head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube to subscribe. For those unfamiliar with Jared, he's an associate professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University and has taught religion courses at the high school and college level since 1998. He studied history and religious education at BYU and earned a PhD in American religious history at Vanderbilt University. We're excited to share this conversation with you and send a huge thanks to Jared for coming on. Well, Jared, welcome back, and thank you so much for being with us. We're excited to have you in the studio again. There's no two better people to have a conversation with. Oh, you're you very too. kind. Thank you. We're so looking forward to this, and we're looking forward to this year because we'll be collaborating a little bit more closely with uh, the Unshaken podcast. So um, I would love to just let you talk about what you're looking forward to with the Book of Mormon this year that we're getting ready to study. Oh, what, what's not to look forward to? <laughs> this People have often asked, because I te- I've taught for, what, 25 years now, and yeah. And when they ask, what's your favorite book of scripture to teach? And yep. for me, I, that's kind of like asking, which is your favorite child? Yeah. Which, of course, you have one, but you can't admit it. No, uh, I love them all. And to me, whatever book I happen to be teaching becomes mm. my favorite. So the Book of Mormon? So this one, <laughs> as soon as January rolls around. Okay. Actually, I'm teaching the Book of Mormon currently at BYU, and so I'm oh. loving it. Uh, but what, wherever we happen to be, it's amazing to me where the scriptures become one great whole. And they start melding together into this beautiful cloud of witnesses mm-hmm. where you have Nephi questioning Paul and mm-hmm. you have Job responding to Lehi and and you have Esther chiming in with with Moroni. And and to me, there's something powerful about integrating those voices. I know there's there's separate t- contexts and different time periods, and that needs to be taken into consideration as well. But there is power in mm-hmm. the canon of Scripture, wherever we might be. Yeah, That's bringing up for me a question already, mm-hmm. which is. So to what extent do you see these the, the scriptures as sort of, a, you know, dialogic, you know, a, a back and forth of competing ideas and working things out versus a, a divine dictation? Great, great question. There's a little of both. I'm even in scripture study. I prove contraries. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so trying to balance <laughs> the two. But to me, there's something powerful about getting scriptural figures in conversation with one another. An example I always love is. So Lehi taught repeatedly in the Book of Mormon that if you'll keep the commandments, you'll prosper in the land. Mm -hmm. And it's so straightforward. That's the Deuteronomist perspective from the Old Testament. And and it's a very stage three Fowler uh, Mm -hmm. or creation stage kind of approach. And as you begin, you need to have that kind of comfort and stability in your mental universe that if I obey, then God will bless me. And I need to be careful about, about disobeying. But if we stay in that forever... We get to a point where why haven't the blessings come through for me the way I, I envisioned them? Yeah. And why isn't God keeping his word when it seems that he isn't or that those blessings are being postponed? And so I always picture Lehi or the Deuteronomist in the Old Testament saying that. And then Job raising his hand on the other side saying, you know, that wasn't exactly my experience. Wow. Uh, and allowing Job to share where he was coming from, mm-hmm. which began with the same kind of cut and dried black and white perspective and then grew throughout his experience with God. And so to me, there's value in, 
and, and especially in this world of paradox and polarity, I need people that are teaching justice when I need to be moved in that direction. And mm -hmm. I need people who are teaching mercy when I need to be pulled in that direction. And the scriptures as a whole, that's why I love studying them over and over and over again and seeing them together, is it does allow things to balance out. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. I want to I want to say in the beginning of this conversation that I think I think one thing that has been on my mind as we get ready to study the Book of Mormon is that <clears throat> there's something particular about the Book of Mormon that can bring up some dissonance if you have questions in a different way than other books of scripture do. And so maybe it's it's just a it's one of those big dominoes that you know if everything feels okay with the Book of Mormon then it feels like you can relax in both directions about your testimony. And then if you have questions about the Book of Mormon, it can feel that that disturbs everything about your testimony, too. Yeah. And so I want to just address that head on before we get into uh, any deeper of a conversation about what's inside this book. But could you just talk to us about for people who have questions about historicity, who feel like those are really in the forefront and who maybe feel like those are obstacles in their willingness to engage with this book this year as a church? Like if they're feeling pushed away by that, by those questions, what, what would you say? To, what would you say to them? Welcome aboard, right? <laughs> uh, that and in some ways, you're, the way you preface the question about the, the Book of Mormon having unique challenges, mm -hmm. in some ways, whatever book of scripture you're studying, there's going to be challenges unique to that text. Uh, my, it, I be, in grad school, I studied a lot of anti-Mormonism, and to make us make sense of anti-religious rhetoric, it began with those that were attacking the church in the 19th century, but grew into. In some ways, anti-Book of Mormonism is small fry compared to anti-Biblicism. <laughs> okay, yeah. And so uh, it ended up being the secular attack on the Bible. And mm -hmm. so I've spent a ton of time studying those who have attacked Old and New Testament scripture. And so many of the same questions and the same challenges exist with Biblicism as with the Book of Mormon. And so in some ways, this is a, an old problem, mm -hmm. uh, not unique to us as Latter-day Saints. But the life of faith and the the ambiguity that we have to be able to learn to navigate is going to be true of of people in whatever area, whether it's Latter Day Saints struggling with questions of historicity of the Book of Mormon, or it, biblical inerrantists, particularly mm -hmm. that are struggling with issues in the Bible. I actually was talking with an evangelical Christian friend who said we were cl we're close enough to each other that he can be brutally honest with me, mm -hmm. and he said at one point, "Your your book shot itself in the foot." And the title page. I mean, you don't even have to enter the text before it's problematic. It's like, oh, really? Uh, what do you mean? And he said, at, at the end of the title page, it admits if there are imperfections. Uh, and to think of Scripture acknowledging that from the very opening page. And I just, again, he, he was being honest with me. I was being honest with him and said, you know, there are, there's a part of me that wishes the Bible included the same kind yeah. of caveat. Because... In my, my area of expertise was in, in Thomas Paine, who wrote The Age of Reason, and he's the, the patron saint of American skepticism and anti-biblicism. And, and he was banking on people having such a brittle belief. I compare br brittle belief and flexible faith, and I'll take a flexible mm. faith any day. Uh, because that brittle belief, if you're banking on something having zero imperfections, then you've set things up with such black and white thinking that it's an all or nothing approach. And if you can't accept the all, then all you've been left with is the nothing. Yeah. And so you throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And as I study Book of Mormon, especially a study of those who have attacked the Book of Mormon throughout its history, uh, to me, there's something very honest about people like Moroni. Moroni was the one that had the biggest oh, sense of inadequacy when it came to the book that he was finishing. And for him to admit that and to wrestle with his own d challenges and difficulties and, and the potential for human error, I see divine fingerprints all over the Book of Mormon. That's what keeps me reading. But I also see human fingerprints on it. And to recognize the mix of both, I think, is, is healthy and valuable. To see the condescension of Christ. Uh, yes, he lived a sinless life, but that divinity could take on humanity. And in some ways, to see Scripture as this treasure in earthen vessels there's going to be things that we wrestle with and struggle with and and just come to the table. Mm -hmm. To me, if we set things up from the very beginning, that you're not allowed to approach this text unless you have a bedrock testimony as certain people define it, mm -hmm. then we have closed off the kinds of conversations that, that Scripture in general is trying to engender. Yeah. 
Is yeah. it possible that someone who feels a lot of doubt or skepticism could actually bring those things to their engagement with the text and, and find it open in new ways because of, because of those, those doubts that they're feeling? I, I remember a great, great question. And I would say the short answer is yes, bring it all. Uh, and and wrestle with these things. I think scripture becomes this incredible site of human growth and divine encounter. And if we're not being real, then can we really expect God to be real with us? And so that vulnerability, that openness, that admission. I remember talking to a student of mine who said his mission president had told him, if your investigators never ask you a single question, then they're not really investigating. Mm. And when I heard that, I thought that all of a sudden, a lot of my dating life made sense. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was young, it's like, okay, that person was not interested because they didn't ask anything about me, right? And I think if there's real interest, then there are gonna be questions we bring to the text. And it becomes dialogic, like you, like you mentioned, not just between scriptural writers, but between scriptural readers and writers. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking them my questions and I'm bringing in my, my wrestle and my my challenges, my questions to it. And I just, because I work with so many people around the world all the time that are dealing with faith crisis, uh, and there's such, I have faces across that I, that I picture in my mind. And there's people I'm emailing currently and and Zoom calls that I have all the time with people that are asking these kinds of questions. Uh, I'm I'm, so impressed with their desire to come to an understanding they they haven't given up on the wrestle yeah. it's they're engaged in it yeah. yeah i i we were just talking about this in another in another context but I, if i imagine a god who is uh most animated by excited by our our growth then would that god not necessarily potentially be more excited by saying wow i'm really excited about the wrestle that you're about to have because of the growth that it's going to cause as opposed to i'm really excited to hand you this answer you know, yeah. uh, that's just going to pop right off the page. If you've ever tried to drive a car without power steering, yeah, you realize that it's really hard to gain direction if you don't have any momentum. Yeah. And I see you, you picture God looking down at Saul and saying, I don't like his direction, but I love the guy's momentum. <laughs> right. yeah, here's somebody with drive, right? And if I can just kind of pick him up and turn him around, then he's going to be going in my direction, right? And, and to see, to me, apathy is the hardest part. And if there's just no interest... Yeah, uh, if I'll put it this way, and I think sometimes the black and white thinking, whether it's black and white in favor or black and white against, yeah. is it it just pulls out any interest in really exploring, opening. Yeah. And so whether I have this solid testimony that it's all true, and so I don't really need to study mm -hmm. it because I've already read it and checked that box and I have a, a testimony, isn't that enough? Or on the opposite side, I, I have a firm testimony that it's completely ahistorical and it was made up and it's yeah. causing more harm than good. I think we've gone from dogmatism in favor and overswung to dogmatism against, and we missed the wrestle somewhere in between. Yeah. And I think if we can provide momentum, again, e even those that attack the Book of Mormon, I, I'm thinking at least you're you're interested in this topic, yeah. Yeah. right? And and I think if we can bring that interest and try to disabuse the public mind, as Joseph Smith put it, if yeah. we can give them, put them in possession of some of the facts, but also acknowledge some of the places that we don't have clear answers, then let mm -hmm. let patients have a perfect work. Yeah. Can we? Can we? I'm sorry. Do you have something? Oh wait. I, I, this Go is ahead. just. Uh, this is bringing something <laughs> up for me too, which I I would love if we could address, you know, somewhat empathetically that. Um, that potential apathy as well, because I, I know I know there are people that are going to hear this yeah. that that feel that because because I feel like I've been through that where um, there would have been times in my life when somebody was you know handing me hand me the scriptures and I'd feel like not yeah. you know yeah. I'm really just not that interested right, right. now you know and uh, it, like so I don't want to dismiss that as sort Good of point. like well there's Great a lost point. cause but as long as we're as long as we're no, either for or against because you know there's I mean? never a lost cause right yeah. so what so if somebody's resonating most uh, out of this conversation so far with the word apathy where what what do we do with that i would love to know the reasons why because it's it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation that needs to be had yeah. i want to understand where they are coming from and what they've been through and how they've approached the text in the past what it's done for them positively how it's affected them negatively how they were raised i mean sometimes people will approach me and say Okay, I know you study anti-Mormonism. I've got this question about fill in the blank. And there's a whole litany of them that, that you can find anywhere. Yeah. And 
and I, I just need a quick answer. So 15 minutes of your time is all I'm asking. And I always laugh and go, oh, this is going to take like two hours. Uh, and they go, well, why? I said, because this, the question's only a part of the story and your life is the rest and, and you matter. I'm a firm believer that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God and that the, and that unfortunately the most efficient things tend to be the least effective things. Mm -hmm. And if I'm ever going to have to choose between efficiency and effectiveness, I'm going to go with effectiveness, even yeah. it if it takes forever. And so to sit down and ask for their story and to try to understand so I can empathize and validate. I mean, when I see people going through these stages of faith and, and descending from the Garden of Eden with all of its beautiful simplicity into the complexity of the fall, there's even sub stages within that stage. And often it starts with nostalgia for the good old days when it, ever, it all made sense. And I had a testimony just open the book and the spirit starts to breathe off of its page. And of course, how could anyone have questions about that? If you, if you can't empathize with those who do have questions, then again, I don't know if we've interrogated the text yeah. well enough, but then to go from nostalgia to this bitterness and this anger. And we, again, we've overswung the pendulum and now I'm mad and I want everyone to feel the same angst that I have. But often that mellows into apathy is often the next one where it's, I don't believe, but I can't convince my true believing member family, family members not to believe with me. And so I'm just going to kind of give up. And if you're in that moment, that's a tough place to be. And again, in some ways it's, it's less combative. There's less friction, yeah. but cause you've kind of just forget the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think there's value in, even if it takes a while for the passage of time to heal some of those old wounds. Yes. I remember reading a book in grad school called the crisis of doubt which was interesting. It wasn't a faith of the crisis of faith. Oh, yeah. It were these, yeah. these British secularists in, 19th, in the 19th century. That's how much of a religion nerd I am. I read about <laughs> British secularists in the 19th century. And it was a story of their beginning to, as Elder Uchtdorf said, be, they began to doubt their doubts. And these were, staunch, they were editors, they were, they were organizers. They, they were doing all in their power to pull people away from Christianity. And at some point they started questioning themselves. What am I, all I'm doing is tearing down. Am I doing anything? What am I building? And did I, was I approaching the Bible from a perspective that maybe I've outgrown by now? And eventually they got to the point, this group of secularists, each in their own way, decided to dust off the Bible and give it a second chance. And yes, it was going to be a more nuanced approach. There's no going back to Eden, but... They, they had an opener, a more open heart, a more open mind, and just putting their toe back in the water with no expectation of where this is going to lead. Yeah. Uh, sometimes apathy can be a good thing if it turns into neutrality. Mm. Because with neutrality, you're open again. Yeah. You know? And, and again, I think there's, it was interesting in, in your question about when we were talking about historicity. Yeah. Uh, I went back and I, I love what you guys do. You seriously, yeah. you t you two combine head and heart in such beautiful ways, oh, where you. you have deep souls and empathetic spirits, and and yet you read so much and you think so hard and you bring such powerful questions to the table that it's always a privilege for anyone sitting in this chair to be able to approach the two of you. Thank you, Jerry. Well, and what was interesting is to go back and listen to other conversations you've had with other people as they wrestle and to go back and listen to other podcasts where, you know, I was listening to one where Terrell Givens was interviewing Joe Spencer about historicity in the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. and just realizing that that's going to be a question a lot of people are going to bring to the text as we open it uh, yeah. yep. you know, very year. soon th this year in, in Book of Mormon study. And because I'm one who likes to have my finger on the pulse of the common, the common Latter-day Saint or ex-Latter-day Saint, I read all the comments after the, uh, and that, that's always a, a minefield, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But there were several that said, that, that just wished that people had more empathy for their struggle. Mm -hmm. And if you've never been through a faith crisis yourself, how do you come to validate what a traumatic experience it is for someone yeah. who's reached that point of apathy or not yet apathy and it's still antipathy yeah. and it's, it's angst and it's anger and when religion is your ultimate concern and all of a sudden it becomes ultimately concerning, I mean, your sky literally has fallen. Yeah. Capital S sky, everything you saw. If the Book of Mormon is the keystone of, of our religion and the keystone of our testimony, as President Benson used to call it, 
if that crumbles, then emotionally and and spiritually, who am I? Where do I where do I go from here? As has my whole life been a lie to this point? Mm -hmm. And so, my, again, I, I wish we had the time to sit down with everyone yeah. who's feeling, wh wh whether it's yeah. anger or apathy <clears throat> yeah. or whatever in between, what what got you to this point and how do how can we validate where you happen to be and how do we help you move forward in a healthy way, whether yeah. it's back to faith or just even understanding those that, yeah. if we can agree to disagree without becoming disagreeable. Yeah, I think for me, um, the, what you said about neutrality becoming openness has has played out. Um, and as I'm trying to think about what, you know, what could the gifts of, of apathy be? Um, because I, mm. it seems like everything has its, its virtues and its vices. Right. Right. But if I, like, if I make a comparison to the physical body, you know, apathy does not bring growth. It doesn't bring progress necessarily like retention right. and right. movement or what bring those things. This, I think potentially in this analogy, the stillness of apathy, what it could bring is, is healing. You know, if you, yeah. if you can just sit for a while and let the slow work of God do its, do its work, yeah. you know, then I think eventually today's, uh, you know, today's tonic can become tomorrow's toxin. And eventually sitting there, like eventually sitting there, I think will no longer be good enough. And there yeah. does need to be a re-engagement in some, in some direction. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's my, that's my hope for, um, for people that have, that have felt that way is that there's there's some time for healing and that there's also a trust that that's not the that's not the end of yeah. the path. Can I add to that though? I I was thinking about that too. Like what what when I have experienced apathy, like was it rest? Was it rest or was it was I was I avoiding something? Mm. And I think I've experienced it both ways. And I'm reminding I'm remembering um this the a conversation we had just really recently with Thomas McConkey and he talked about how sometimes that we was get such a great interview, about by atonement. The way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or at one minute. And honestly, Tim, your that oh. moment of just oh. it was you, just <laughs> such a sweet uh yeah. that to me is in some ways is that's what the scriptures are trying to invite us into. Yeah. And for the listeners that haven't heard that, it's just this this vulnerability, this raw this is where I am. This is where I've been. Where do I go from here? And and yeah. to allow those kinds of experiences to take yeah. shape in the pages of Scripture. Yeah, you know where where an Emma Smith coaxes you in this direction in section twenty five, or yeah. or yeah. you know what I mean. Totally. Brother Jared's pulling you in this direction in Ether three, and yes. Yeah. Any, anyway, sorry to interrupt, no. but I just well, wanted the, to honor no, I, that and experience you I, guys I, had. I'm glad you brought that up. Because this is another thought, but but really quickly, what Thomas Thomas talks about how sometimes we get used to dismissing the moment. We just in in an in an effort to avoid pain, we dismiss and dismiss and dismiss and override mm -hmm. yeah. that that feeling of being present. And then the what happens is that we it's like a habit, and we start doing that in positive ways too. Like we're so used to not being in the yeah. now that we're not feeling nourishment when it's coming. And so for me, I think I have experienced the scriptures that way. Like it was too painful. I was avoiding, and I got really used to just resisting yeah. anything that might be painful. That I I sort of built this wall. That was that could have been very nourishing, and so in that way, I think apathy really did need to become neutralized before I could start reabsorbing yeah, yeah. goodness. But what I, one thing I want to add about this that that the prodigal son conversation with Tim and Thomas that you were reminding me of already is this um, the Jewish practice of havruta is something I've been learning a little bit about teach, and teach I'm very me. interested in and. I shouldn't be talking about it because I'm very new to this, but it was it just like feels exciting to me and I want to understand it more. But my my understanding is that students will bring in this practice will bring a scripture or a, a, an idea and um, they'll bring to each other to a conversation partner a question and propose an answer. And mm -hmm. then their conversation partner will propose a, a, a counter answer. And the idea is that truth is found in the conversation. That yeah. The truth is not that one of them will arrive at the answer. It's this, this amalgamation of the entire conversation that is where you arrive at something true. And I feel like that's kind of what you're saying that like yeah. with all the humanity and all the divinity that the scriptures have to be this conversation. And, and I love that example of Tim and Thomas's conversation about the prodigal son because it opened up onto something that I had never yeah, yeah. seen that I could feel uh -huh. intuitively was so true about yeah. about these two ways that were all all the sons. No, that, that's beautiful, Aubrey. It really is. It, it, it's funny because when I was young, I've always loved scripture. Uh, I was one of those strange. I, I, the very first uh, entry I ever wrote in a journal. I was seven years old and I got okay. my journal for my first journal for Christmas. But that same Christmas, I'd also got my first set of scriptures. Yeah. And there I was two months away from being baptized and and writing in that very first journal, 
I got all, I was like listing all the things I got for Christmas. Does that sound like a seven year old? And I got this and I got that. It was so cool. It was so fun. And then it said, I was still shocked to look at my little seven year old handwriting as it said, my favorite present that I got was my Bible. Oh. And I, I, because it was Christmas, I, I said, I went and I start. I thought it'd be fun to skim through and see if I could find verses about Jesus's birth. Now, I don't know how Aww. a seven-year-old skims scripture, wow. right? But, but I said, <laughs> and I had my little red pencil and I was marking scriptures about Jesus's birth. And I said, what a fun day it was. And wow. for the oh, last 40 plus years, I've been having fun days with my red pencil <laughs> and my scriptures and just <laughs> diving yeah. in. But I remember wanting, I was always drawn to the Old Testament, particularly just mm -hmm. the Hebrew Bible was amazing. I remember taking Hebrew classes in, in, in college and, and figuring, yes, I want to become a Hebrew Bible scholar. And... And then through an, just all kinds of amazing experiences. Uh, when I was in grad school and really starting to, to dig in, I was, this was one of those tender mercies where I read an article from a Harvard Islamicist of all people. Wil Wil Wilfred Cantwell Smith is his name, uh, former president of the American As uh, Academy of Religion, just really well-respected scholar, uh, late 20th century. Uh, Islam was his area of expertise. And he was talking about the Quran and said, most scholars tend to privilege seventh century Arabia because that's when the Quran was produced. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to understand the world behind the text and what, what was it that influenced Muhammad in the, in the creation of this, of this scripture. And then he said, so to you and to you biblical scholars, you privilege the world behind the text as well. And so the archeology span and the yeah. philology and the history and all these things. And then he said, but the Quran is just as important in 15th century Spain to help the Moors make sense of their expulsion. Uh, it's just as important in 21st century Indonesia. Yeah. And how are people coming to the text and bringing their challenges and their questions? And then he said, so to you biblical scholars, why do you spend so much time in first century Palestine or seventh century BCE Babylon? when the Bible is just as important in 16th century Germany, think Martin Luther, you know, 19th century America, think Joseph Smith, 21st century Sub-Saharan Africa, and think of the growth of Christianity there. And it, all of a sudden it struck me, I'm more interested in the world in front of the text than I am in the world behind the text. I, the way he put it basically was, there are those who study the world that created the Bible, and there are those who study the worlds, plural, that the Bible creates. Wow. And when that dawned on me, everything shifted. That's what I'm drawn to. And I'm so grateful for colleagues that, that know so well the world behind the Bible, but the world in front of it, or in this case, the world in front of the Book of Mormon, when people are coming to it with their questions, their concerns, mm -hmm. Uh, again, whether it's reception history, whether it's rejection history, I've studied both of those and people that try to pick it apart and, and others who are just trying to make sense of it. I'm fascinated by the conversations people have had with this yeah. incredible book of scripture. Wow. And so to, that's one thing I'm looking forward to this upcoming year of studying it with people is you're just a, as much a part of the story as Nephi or Limhi or Abinadi. It's, and especially in the book of Mormon's case, Moroni makes it so clear. I speak to you as though you were present and yet yeah. you are not or Mormon to, to interrupt the narrative and break the fourth wall and so frequently say, and thus we see. And as Elder Irene has said, what a generous gift it was to use the, pr the plural pronoun there. Mm. You know, where it's like, <laughs> oh, I hadn't seen that actually, yeah. but now that you mention it, or, or even to say, well, yeah, Mormon, but I don't know if I, compl is that exactly how I see it? Yeah. And then again, as we engage together, then all of a sudden the scriptures, in my mind, do what they're meant to do, which is mm -hmm. to connect us with a, a higher and holier source than the scriptures themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. So in your mind, what's, could you paint the vision for the world that you think the Book of Mormon could help create? And how is it mm, doing that? Question. What's the, you know, what's the, in broad strokes, what's the conversation that the Book of Mormon is having that would lead to, lead I, to I that love vision? that question. That's an inspiring. <laughs> well, so, so I study rhetoric uh, to try to make sense of how people attack faith, defend faith, and so on. I'm less interested in, in, in all the answers uh, that people come up with one way or the other, and more interested in just the conversation and the wrestle and, and how they're posing the question mm -hmm. uh, and how they're posing their answers. In, in rhetorical studies, they speak of imagined audiences and a rhetorician or a, in this case a scriptural writer is imagining 
who am I writing to? And like I said, especially when you get to Mormon and Moroni, that's all they have is an imagined audience because there is no literal audience in front of them. Okay, that ship has sailed. That ship has crashed. Uh, and so to speak to a, a latter day, what kind of audience am I envisioning? Uh, Kenneth Burke was a great 20th century rhetorical scholar, and he would talk about rhetoric not as persuasion, but as identification. Mm -hmm. And that when you're speaking, people are identifying with your language and in some ways being drawn in. Other rhetorical scholars have talked about constitutive rhetoric, where rhetoric constitutes something. It brings mm -hmm. a community into, into existence. And, and to me, to picture... Again, whether it's Mormon and Moroni, whether it's Nephi and Lehi at the beginning, what's their imagined audience? What is this? What, what kind of group is going to coalesce around these yeah. around these words? And the kind of community that the Book of Mormon gathers is an assembly of saints that, in my mind, is going to change the world. Mm. Uh, to me one of the un overarching underlying messages from start to finish in the Book of Mormon is the gathering of Israel. And it treats that topic with such richness and complexity. Uh, it's less about restoring the gospel, less about restoring the church, less about restoring the priesthood. None of those are words that the Lord uses in Scripture. It's more about restoring God's people to a right relationship with Him. And I see the Book of Mormon calling us to that work uh, infusing us with that glory, describing the world we live in in such stark terms where we know what we're up against and what people will be lost in. And, and when Mormon says, and thus we see, I, I want to share his vision. Yeah. When Moroni calls us to, to approach the text with charity and more importantly to, to approach one another with charity, mm -hmm. The kind of disciple that Book of Mormon prophets were envisioning inspires me. I, I want to I become that. that kind of person. Yeah. I wonder how far you feel like, or or, or how um, deeply we're a part of this conversation. Because I I could imagine someone could hear what you're saying and say, yeah, we're we're called to engage, as in we're called to mine for what the original meaning was. But I feel like that maybe what you're saying is that's that's being concerned about the world before the text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but, but I wonder how, you know, how much freedom do you feel like we have to engage the sacred text in a way that means we are interpreting and reinterpreting what these words actually mean. And maybe it's actually different than what they originally meant. Like, do you, do you feel like question. that's a, yeah. that's part of our, in, in my our own calling? Yeah. Great question. Aubrey. In, in my own teaching, I always try to keep one eye on my students and the other <laughs> eye on whoever's writings I am teaching that day. And if I start to see either party start to roll their eyes, I get nervous. <laughs> uh, in other words, if I'm teaching Moroni, for example, I want to be true to his intent and true to his words. And I want him in the back of my classroom nodding and going, yep. Mm. Or even like looking quizzically, but thinking, I see where you're going with that. I'm not sure if that crossed my mind, but I'm glad it's crossing yours because we're now in conversation. At the same time, I don't want my students to roll their eyes to the point where does this have any applicability? Is there any relevance here at all? Mm -hmm. uh, and so to, to I'll, I'll, let, me, let me put it this way. This might be helpful. The Book of Mormon, particularly, even more than the Bible, is incredibly self-aware, mm -hmm. but it's not self-absorbed. And to me, there's a real interesting difference there. Its self-awareness comes in practically every page as it talks about itself. Yeah and its construction and hit the plates and I'm passing them down to this and I made these with my own hands and, and so on. It's very self-aware. Mm -hmm. uh, it's aware of the purpose that it's supposed to, to perform and what, what, when it will come forth. And it's the sign that it's the father's go-to moment of he's beginning his work again and gathering his children home. There's, there's so much, again, self-awareness of the book within the book. But it's not so self-absorbed as if to think that it is its own end. It knows very clearly that it's only means. And if it's accomplishing that mean, if it's accomplishing its ends, then it's doing what it's yeah. supposed to. I, I'm always fascinated by the way Nephi says it at the end of his writings, the, the original Nephi. In 2 Nephi 33, when he basically speaks to his Latter-day audience, this imagined group of, of uh, readers at some point, and he basically says, if you don't like my book, that's okay. 
<laughs> you know, and, and again, that's that's not that's <laughs> self aware. That's just, that's self aware without being self absorbed. Yeah. yeah, it's a matter because he says, if you don't believe in these words, please believe in Jesus. Mm. Wow. And so to have that focal point that this book is meant to bring you to Christ, yeah. and Christ will take it from there. You know that he's again t- uh, thesis statement, First Nephi chapter one. Uh, that I am going to show you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. That's that's m- my yeah. purpose, Nephi says. Yeah. And so at the end of his of his writings, if that served if this book served its purpose, you've come to know Jesus. So okay, yeah. So so this is totally what I'm getting at. So like do you feel like part of our work in this generation can be to continue the conversation about racism, for example, and mm-hmm. reinterpret what we're reading instead. Cause I, mm-hmm. I, I think that there's a strong impulse to try to find ways to change the words and believe that like, it couldn't, it couldn't be, it couldn't be that there is racism in the book of Mormon. So like, how can we, how can we like twist this and manipulate it to mean something else? Yeah. And could it just be that this is our work to say, we reject racism and maybe that is what it meant, but that is not what we yeah. do now. And like, is, are we still, can we be part of the project in that way? And, and I think it's not just racism. Like there, um, there are these consistent narratives of othering of like mm-hmm, being mm-hmm. a chosen and exclusive people. And someone is a true villain and a, even a whole people can be the bad guys. And so can it just be that we recognize these and, and, and start the conversation in our whatever generation we approach the text from and can that be holy too like can that be a way to engage the sacred text well and in some ways the book the book the people within the book do they start the process themselves right and so it's like here they are they inherit this view of things and so much of the book of mormon from honestly you could say from jacob on but you could also you could probably more more fully start talking about it from about Sons of Mosiah on, okay. where it becomes what might be considered a racist text becomes an anti-racist text mm-hmm. because you have Nephites that are going out of their way to reach people on the other side of things. You have in the book of Helaman a cl- complete flip-flop where what seemed to be the chosen people are now the unchosen people mm-hmm. and who seem to be the, from the unchosen. I mean, the Samuel, the Lamanite, and he forces the issue by referring to himself. It's like he's calling out this wow. whatever latent racism or, again, othering might be present among the Nephites. And so to see even the Lord through the book forcing us to engage in those, some, so those kinds of wrestles, mm-hmm. I think is, again, part of the beauty of Scripture is here's the place to bring up things that might be uncomfortable. Uh, it's going to push us. Uh, I think it it forces us to grapple with the text and with ourselves and the our inner demons as well as the better angels of our nature and and I see the Book of Mormon allowing for those kinds of conversations in beautiful ways. I mean the yeah. the inside and the outside like you're describing and I mean to to have a chosen a so-called chosen people in our post-colonial world that's a really tricky thing. Yeah. And yet to even take the language of the covenant from the start that in thee and in thy seed it's incredibly exclusivistic language shall all the king, all the families of the earth be blessed. That's radically inclusive language. Yeah. I mean, so even in the, the way the covenant is first uh, explained, there's a proving of contraries right there. And it's exclusivity in pursuit of inclusivity the whole time. Yeah. And I think the Book of Mormon calls us to that kind of work as well. Yeah. I love that. I, I've heard you say, I've heard you ask, you know, you have to consider if you're, if you look at the Book of Mormon and all, and all sacred texts as a catalog or a catalyst. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that that's a way to just shift the paradigm a little bit that it's not, it's, um, you're, you're not, you're not breaking the text by talking about it and having conversations and extrapolating. You're actually, that's, that's part of the holy work of letting it be a catalyst. Yeah. Well, I think that's what it, always intended itself to be. Yeah. I mean, when the Lord, we we always misquote this verse, but in John 5, when Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, search the scriptures for in them, you think they have eternal, you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And we always quote that verse to say, see, Jesus said to go search the scriptures. And he's like, no, what he's saying there is that's all you guys do. All you do is search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but they're a means I'm the end. They testify of me. And so if you th- think you love the scriptures and yet you don't hear my voice in them, you don't recognize me in them, if they're not driving you to become a true disciple, then you've turned them into a mere catalog of revelation. 
and not allowed them to become a catalyst for revelations of your own. So to me, there's something powerful about turning to scripture and engaging in this cloud of witnesses, bringing your questions to the text, your difficulties, and allowing them to respond to them, and then spurring your connection with heaven. Even when you think of the way the Book of Mormon first came onto the scene, where the angel Moroni appears to Joseph Smith and describes this, and Joseph talks about this conduit opening to heaven. And to me, I don't know if there's a better description of scripture than that, that this is meant to be our conduit. And if we simply free, you know, freeze it into place and that's all it ever was. Again, I don't want to be untrue to the text and its context and its history and mm -hmm. so on. But I also don't want the Lord looking at me going, that's all you do is study scripture. They're supposed mm -hmm. to come to me. Or Nephi thinking, okay, you love the book or you hate the book. It was never about the book. Yeah. You know, it's what is it doing in, for your testimony of Jesus Christ? How is it affecting the way you treat other people? And I think the best evidence of the Book of Mormon's power is when it does for us what it was designed to do in creating true disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, even the way Moroni's promise comes, I, for two years I banged my head against every Puerto Rican wall on my mission of just, but it's true, and just ask God and he'll tell you the book is true, the book is true. <laughs> and years later, it finally dawned on me that I was forcing the book to be more self-absorbed than it had ever intended. And again, I was doing Nephi a disservice and Moroni a disservice. The way he really prefaces his promise is, when you receive these things, ponder how merciful God has been from the days of Adam up until the moment that you receive these things. I mean, talk about drawing the audience into the conversation. Yeah. It's not just think about a merciful God from creation on down to my time period. It's no, to your time period. So think about his mercies in the Old Testament. Think of them in, in the New, in the Book of Mormon, in your own life to the moment that you're reading this book and then ponder that in your heart. Because if, again, if thesis statement from chapter one of Nephi was, I'm going to show you the tender mercies, and then Moroni's promise at the end of the book, think about how merciful the Lord has been. It's basically in his conclusion, he's asking, did, did we do what we set out to do? Have we introduced you to a merciful God, one that you can completely trust in so that he can change you, save you, turn you into something more than you'd otherwise be? And then ask God if that's true. And to me, the way I perceive Moroni's promise there is not a, less a matter of, is the Book of Mormon true? And more a matter of, did the Book of Mormon work? Mm -hmm. yeah. Did it do what it was intended to do? And if we can become that kind of disciple, you see, if I'm Bible bashing in the Book of Mormon's favor or... Mm -hmm. uh, against it, but especially those that are just so adamant, it's true, it's true, and they're using it as a club. It didn't work for you, did it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All you see is its truth, but you're not as kind and compassionate and as tender and as merciful as the book is inviting you to be. Yeah. You're still not quite like Jesus. And I'm not, so I keep reading the text, and I keep studying, and I keep engaging in these conversations. And little by little, it is rubbing off my rough edges. Yeah. I'd be, that's, I, I love everything you just said. And I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing, even on a personal level, sort of what your daily devotional practice looks like, how you translate um, what you're reading on the page into how you how you show up in the world. How, how is the Book of Mormon actually working in your words mm -hmm. for, for you? So I love the cross. Uh, I know it's not the symbol of our membership, but if our, President Hinckley said the symbol of our membership is the life of, its, of our members, right? And so that symbol better be inspired by the symbol of Christianity. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that my life should be de depict the fact that I believe in, in a savior who died for me and rose from the grave. And when Jesus says to take up the cross daily, that's what I feel is my, my purpose as a, as a disciple. And again, back to contraries, there's a vertical component of our discipleship and there's a horizontal component. And so to take the cross 
And the first commandment is to love God with all my heart, my heart, my mind, and strength. And my scripture study, as I pour over the Book of Mormon, the Bible, the Doctrine and Covenants, I'm depending on where I'm teaching or what I'm studying or the questions that I'm bringing, I typically am running throughout the canon. Uh, but it's a way for me to tap into something transcendent and to connect with the divine and to learn things about, about God, about my neighbor. And if I feel like I have connected in ways that the scripture intends and the way, more importantly, that the Lord intends, then I'm ready to go out throughout my day with the horizontal crossbeam of loving my neighbor. If I haven't found, tapped into transcendence, I can't lift my neighbor very high off the ground. Mm -hmm. But if all I am is this vertical post, then I'm not reaching out to bless those around me. And so my own daily devotion is steeped in scripture, but also with an eye, who am I going to help with this today? And I'm amazed. What was it that allowed the Lord to multiply loaves and fishes? Was that there was need. And if it had just been a small handful of disciples, uh, two loaves and or five loaves and two fishes could have been enough. But the miracles don't come until you realize there's more hungry souls than me. And that's one of the great blessings of teaching, uh, of ministering to one another, of just engaging each other in conversation, is I can, I can consecrate my time in Scripture to the welfare of other people. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, has been eye-opening because it's not just my questions I'm bringing to the text. It's everyone else's, too. And then the Lord really opens the eyes of your understanding as you find answers to questions you didn't even know you should have asked. Yeah. Other people are. I, w I would love to kind of start wrapping up there, but maybe we, maybe we should have started here, but what do you think makes a text sacred? You know, if we're putting aside this starting point of historicity, because it feels like that's an easy assumption to make that that's why it's sacred. It was because mm. these were prophets and God said, write this and then it was written. So if you, if that's not priority number one, if it's about how the Book of Mormon works, then then what what can you say about what makes a text sacred? And then and also secondly, like what's valuable about about having a shared sacred text in community? Yeah, great. if you can't all agree, no, if you yeah. can't all agree on on what it is, even yeah, you know, all well, those are deep questions. Uh, again, I think there's something to be said for the outward facing nature of scripture. Mm -hmm. that it's trying to engage an audience that wasn't present in its creation. Uh, the, the, I, I'm fascinated by canonical criticism. There's so many forms of higher biblical criticism that you can take to any book of scripture. Mm -hmm. And canonical criticism really takes more seriously the community that forms around that text. So what we talked about earlier about imagined communities and, and constitutive rhetoric of bring, people that are assembling around a book of scripture. And the fact that it still resonates suggests that we are still infusing the book with sacredness because in some way it's infusing us with sacredness as well. That it is teaching us and changing us and transforming us in powerful ways. And so no wonder I keep coming back to these words. Uh, and there's a community of fellow, uh, fellow wrestlers uh, that are trying to make sense of it too. And this book, I mean, when the book becomes agent rather than just object, something powerful is happening. And to me, that's the beauty of, to me, that's what makes it sacred because it's living, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it's, it's engaging in a process of sanctification that we're all trying to engage in. And, and it provides almost the, the theater for these kinds of conversations to take place. And we're yes, here exactly. today yeah. discussing this because it's allowing for these kinds yeah. of things. And hopefully the kinds of mental or spiritual breakthroughs that we might have, uh, books of scripture like this are allowing that to happen. Yeah. I, I think we can have a very broad definition of, of scripture and of sacred text uh, as, it, as, it, as it moves us and changes us and so on. The way Mor the Mormon puts it at the end of the book of, Mor book of Moroni, that if it persuades you to believe in Christ, if it makes you into someone that's more like him, embrace it. Yeah. Um, let me just maybe ask this as a final question. Uh, we're, I mean, like Aubrey mentioned, we're very excited to be in sort of informal partnership really with yeah. Unshaken, you know, as, as Faith Matters. And 
um, we think that the work that you do is incredibly valuable. It, I think it's important important to point out that it's a labor of love. Uh, like you know, us yeah. and many of the people on the Faith Matters team, this is nobody's getting paid. Uh, why why do you do what you do? What what inspires you to participate in this work? Great question. At first, I'm a teacher at heart. I just want there's something powerful about watching people change and be able to do things they couldn't do before and become things they couldn't be before. And originally COVID hit in the middle of a semester and I just was dying to connect, stay connected with my students. Mm -hmm. And I had no intention of, of starting anything, uh, but I just wanted to keep teaching. And I had, I have a strong testimony that scripture is where lives can change. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And so if you want to be with God, if you want to be more like God, then be in your beginning, begin with the word. Start there. Yeah. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, this is the word made flesh. There's so much power here. And so for me, I just clicked record on my laptop <laughs> and it was the most B, B movie garage band. I, again, I didn't intend it for it to become anything. It was, yeah. I'm just trying to teach my students. And I'm amazed at the hunger of people all around the world that just want to spend time in scripture. And I've learned, I learned the hard way that expectation without education is frustration. <laughs> and especially those raised in the church, you, you're raised with this expectation, mm -hmm. study your scriptures, study your scriptures, study your scriptures. But we've, I think we've done a lousy job of training people how to get something out of the meaning that it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so with that expectation and its lack of education, no wonder people sometimes approach the, approach the text with frustration. And I just want people to overcome that frustration because there's so much here that I want them to find. And, and so that's why I started recording things and sending it out there. And then it kind of took on a life of its own. And I mean, as you both know, you just kind of keep, you keep going. Uh, people need, and yeah. it is a labor of love and it's, uh, but I do love the people I get to teach. Yeah, I love your hearers. I love mine. I love, I just love the children of God and feel deeply about their potential to become amazing. And I trust them. I trust the process. I trust God. I trust his word. And so wherever they happen to be in the process, whether they're angry or apathetic or all the other things we talked about earlier, I just wish we could sit down one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and see where they're coming from and see where the scriptures can help them move forward from there. Yeah, we, we love can, that. We've, we can feel that from you. Yeah, you, I, and I feel like you've modeled that for us over and over that the, the, the word is the beginning. It's never the end. It yeah. was never meant to be the end. Like this is the, this is, Such it cool is point. the beginning of the conversation. And, and that makes me excited to engage with our community in this, in this very peculiar thing that we do together. And, and I think it will be a special year. So thanks so much for doing it with us. So. Thanks, Thanks, Jared. Okay, thanks so much for listening, and we really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jared Halverson. And again, if you liked what you heard from Jared today, we'd encourage you to head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube to check out Unshaken. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen on. It really helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.